Good weekend. One more week down. Uh, I did send out Blackboard announcement. We'll move our exam to next week. Uh, and that, that'll be next week, Friday is the exam. That following Monday will be the, the lab practical. So probably our nematode will be a little bit compressed, at least in the lab. Um, so that first week of the nematodes, we'll have, we'll have our presentation. So um, we'll have to pick, a, pick out who's going to go when for the presentations, for the nematode presentations. All right, so uh, as part of that, uh, our quizzes go live. So they were supposed to come down on Wednesday, and I think the syllabus said I was going to hold them, have them up until Wednesday. Uh, since we've delayed the exam, uh, I have the quizzes coming off next week, Tuesday. So if you didn't take them and you're looking for late credit, you need to get them done before Tuesday morning, like 8 a.m. is when, when they go. So that way, I, I do anticipate finishing the cestodes probably on Monday, uh, so that they go live, you'll have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday to prep for the exams. All right? Yep. Is there a way Blackboard, or I guess, does it have to be live, but you can't see on the tool, that makes sense? Should be able to see the grade for the quiz, right? Or well, no, I can see the grade for the quiz, but, like, but you can't see the key. Together, like, for the class. like you know what I mean? Like all the quizzes together. What? How many points I have? Oh, as of right now. Yeah, I don't have that. Okay. I don't do it because we 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 weight the quizzes okay. differently for the for the for the actual component. So you have the grade. Uh, what you're going to do is take uh, <clears throat> take whatever your average is for those quizzes. At, Drop the lowest. Drop the lowest grade. Take the average, and then that is 15%, I think, or 15%, so 0.15, and that kind of gives you, and then it's 80% of that, because lecture is 80, no, it's 75%. Uh, I think lecture is 75. So yeah, I can, I can help you out. As we get closer to finishing that third exam, I'll have grades up to date. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll have like current grade, current lecture, and then current lab, and then current total grade. So that way we can, we can see where, where we're at. All right. Parasites in the news. Didn't catch this one. Uh, Dr. Dixon told me about it. Uh, this was today. Popped up. I had to do a search. Uh, Cuban tree frogs in Florida carrying parasite that could be deadly to pets and humans. Um, rat lung, lungworm is angio, uh, angiostrongulus. Um, it's actually a problem in Hawaii. Um, goes into like snails and slugs are the first intermediate host, uh, and then the second intermediate or the the next host then is rats. So the rats carry the adult, bless you. They carry the adult, and they, they pass the eggs. In this case, Cuban tree frogs in Florida are becoming infected. And that's kind of significant, because you don't normally see that sort of diversity, that generalization in hosts. Like when we talk about specialists and generalists, we're talking about, oh, you're a generalist if you can infect a couple different genre of fish, you know, like bass and bluegill and you know maybe some catfish. Right? That's pretty generalized, but it's still fish. As a definitive host, you're in like we talk about sheep and cattle, you know, and humans may be able to, to serve as a host. But you don't see sheep and cattle and then also an amphibian or a ho or, or a fish as that that definitive host. So this is actually pretty pretty cool to see this. Now I have to try to find the actual paper where they talk about it because, of course, the, the news articles are, are a little bit sketchy. Uh, I even w I went to here for the press release, which gave you more information, of course. Uh, but what do, we, what do we know about it? Uh, rat lungworm, which is it, 
We know a lot because of what it could do in humans. So you get your eggs, they go into your slugs, snails and slugs, snails and slugs get consumed by rats. Uh, the problem is when these guys, snails and slugs, get on our food, uh, unwashed lettuce, and salad stuff, and then you accidentally consume a slug, or the slug gets smashed, and you still eat it. I mean, it's going to be hard to see you know, a small slug, and maybe macerated when you're, when you're putting on a bunch of balsamic vinaigrette dressing. Kind of the idea. All right, but you ingest it. You can also get it by eating some of the uh, crustaceans. Uh, you know, you're not eating them cooked. You cook it, you're good. Uh, and then humans get it. Problem with humans is that they tend to go to the brain and form what we have is uh, meningitis, eosinophilic meningitis. So you know, inflammation, pressure buildup in the brain, headaches, coma, death, and, and so forth. This is actually being a problem in, Florida, in Hawaii because a lot of places in Hawaii capture rainwater in cisterns and then utilize those water uh, for drinking. All right, and we don't just have to ingest these guys. We can actually ingest that larval stage. Uh, and what happens is that cistern, that moist cistern, attracts things like snails and slugs. They go in there. They bring their their parasite with them. When they die, the parasites persist in the water. So there is there there's a, uh, a government agency that they go around and they educate the public on rat lungworm, and they educate the public on how do you properly seal up your cistern to avoid this. And you know, they go out around and test cisterns and stuff for all that stuff. So uh, we're not going to talk about Angiostrongulus. That is potentially a, uh, a species that, that we could talk about in the lab, but um, we don't talk about it here in lecture. So parasites in the news. Pretty, pretty current parasite in the news. But yeah, switching from rat to a frog. And then that's, you can also talk about the Cuban tree frog, because that's an invasive species. All right, any questions? Left off with polystoma intergeromal. Uh, intergeromal. I guess that's how you say it. All right, we went over the life cycle. Interesting in the life cycle because it goes to the gills uh, of the tadpoles, it can reproduce on the gills of the tadpoles, but once tadpoles start to uh, metamorphose, they rapidly move across the body surface to get into the bladder, right? So same hopes, really. We had a question, what's definitive, what's intermediate? Well, they're both basically definitive hosts, both stages. All right, so our last example for the monogenes is diplozoan paradoxum, and the name, should be enough. Paradoxum. It's almost like a paradox. So this guy we present because it has unusual sexual reproduction. It's unusual because our worms will form, will fuse, two worms will fuse so that they can then reproduce sexually. Once they fuse, that new life cycle stage is called a diporpa. It's a juvenile stage with two hackers and a ventral sucker and dorsal papillae that are opposite of each other. So you've got your hacker, you have your ventral suckers, and what ends up happening is so your A, freshly hatched, here it is, that gets released, all right? And then it develops into a B stage, a diporpa juvenile. Uh, and then they fuse and form one of these. That's, that's your adult. So you've got basically two sets of organs. But you have basically one is going to serve as a male and the other is a female and vice versa. So you've got both male and female, uh, but, they're, but they're fertilizing each other's eggs. So you get a lot of this, um, the diversity from sexual reproduction. All right, so definitive host is European cyprinid fishes. And 
let's go through this life cycle. Uh, I don't have so we can't see the doors of the building. So we have mature adults. Uh, we're going to get it up here. Let's do it here. Okay. So mature adults, we're going to be on the fish gills. So what these mature adults do, they drop the egg. City and then zoom around and attach to the host. So we're basically in the water here. transmission. This thing sits around and hopes to find another diporpa that attaches. to that dorsal papilla. And so both papillae now have the ventral sucker that's attached to it. All right. And this is important because this diporba, they die. They die by winter, if not paired. So they die by winter if they don't pair up. See, we've got another guy, another one coming in. So you need two of them. You're going to pair your diporba, and then you're going to fuse. So you actually get fusion where now they start sharing the bracket that's inside. So now all the gonads are shared inside a single body, and it looks kind of like that, that Y shaped structure. All right. And once we fuse, now we mature into the adults. It's this fusion that triggers maturation. So it's one of those things. Well, you didn't fuse, so you're not going to mature. You're going to stay at the di diporpa stage right? because you need that fusion in order to start maturing. Now, as part of this fusion, your feet, your male genital duct 
will open near the female genital duct of the other individual. general duct terminates near the female general duct of the other individual and it's reciprocal. All right, so they're both, their male general ducts are going to open near that female gen general duct and this promotes cross fertilization. Right. That's really the whole reason for that. Now, this life cycle exhibits seasonal patterns in reproduction. Right, so we have seasonal release of eggs. With most of the eggs, or actually you can say functioning gonads, in spring and summer. Late summer, they stop functioning. Fall, non-functioning. Right. And there's a reason. Right? These eggs have to get, they're going to hatch the oncomericidium. That oncomericidium is going to have to get the egg. So what they're actually doing is starting to time their pattern of reproduction with the pattern of reproduction of the host. Because the eggs are going to hatch when it gets certain stimulus. So it needs light intensity, it needs a large amount of light. If it's dark, it's not going to hatch. It just knows it's not in an area where our next host is going to be. And water turbulence. So the water turbulence could be due to spawning activity. Now with spawning activity, you have a bunch of fish hosts coming together to spawn. So a lot of individuals increase the chance that Aquamere City is going to find a host. Also some feeding activity, especially if they get together to, to go on a feeding frenzy. A lot of hosts, host area, is going to make it more likely that the Uncle City is going to get it. It's going to make it. Again, remember, these have a finite amount of energy. Once they hatch, they normally have less than 24 hours to find that host. It's better for them to sit and wait it out in the egg than it is to hatch and try to find a host. So we're releasing their life cycles to try to coincide with spring and summer where you're going to have a lot of individuals that are either spawning or close together as feeding. As the water temperature drops in the fall and the winter, activity of the fish starts to decline. All right? They start to decline less. It'll be harder for the parasite to transmit. Questions? So there's no intermediate host? Nope. One host. Direct life cycle. Actually, kind of kind of cool when when you look at, at the at the uh, at the body at the morphology because I mean it's you don't see this I mean it's like how on earth did they decide they're going to fuse you know what why what was the benefit I think the fusion is probably related to cross fertilization and somehow once they attach to each other they found a benefit to those that have uh, had a higher propensity to attach to another. Uh, they're going to have a higher fitness, leave more offspring, and then just gradually you start having this, this transition. So, so that's, yeah, this is our dicorpus stage. Two hafters. Here's our hafter. There's one. Here's the second one. You've got your ventral sucker. You've got a dorsal papillae on the opposite side. That's kind of where the suckers are kind of reaching around to grab the, the dorsal side, and then you get your fusion, your sharing, sharing the insides.
right? Questions? All right, so that wraps up the monogenes. Uh, I have a quiz that should have gone live at this point. So I said that de deadline for that quiz is Wednesday night. So let's get done, review. Um, and we will continue on. <coughs> All right. So Sesto. Still in the phylum platyhelminthes, these still flatworms. We're in class. You're going to see it as Eusestoda, or you'll also see it as Cestoidia. Right? So I've been kind of transitioning to the Cestoidia. I kind of think that, and that's a consistency with like monogenoidia. Um, but you'll see Eusestoda uh, as well. All right, so these are the tapeworms. These are the tapeworms. All of the members. Tapeworms are parasitic. And we've known about it. We've known about it for a while. Great advertisement. Who needs dieting when you can just get a tapeworm? Yeah, it's a myth. But it's a myth. That was something that I, I thought growing up as a kid. That, that if you see the commercials for you know, donate, donate money. I always thought it was they were that skinny because they had a bunch of tapeworms. Man, some of the myths that we tell our kids or that we grow up. My kids, my kids know that, know better. So, uh, yeah, this is an old, get tapeworms, get tapeworms. These get members, in fact, all classes of vertebra vertebrates except the agnathids. These are the jawless fish. You don't find tapeworms in there. Kind of odd. Right? Kind of odd. The adult processos are almost always found in the intestines or the accessory structure. Structures immediately attached to the intestines. So think bile duct, gallbladder, uh, stomach. You, you can, they can go in. And all species in this class require an intermediate host. So no uh, anoxinous life cycles. They're all going to be complex life cycles. At least two hosts. Actually, most of them are two hosts. Uh, we do have uh, one that's a three-host life cycle that we'll talk about. They're going to range in size from a few millimeters to over 20 meters. Those are the big human tapeworms. Yep, we can get them. We can get them. Say almost all are monoecious. Almost all are monoecious. Um, I don't know. I can't think of any that are dioecious. So there's probably undiscovered ones out there. We still don't know about. But when we talk about being monoecious, key thing here is that we have a complete reproductive structure in each proglottid, and the proglottid is going to be the individual segments those individual boxes that we'll see. So each each of those has complete set of male and female reproductive structures. Oh darn it. You know what? I did the life cycle and I didn't increase increase the uh, the screen. So what we'll do, we just have to remind me when we're done, I'll open up the screen and we'll get the life cycle on the board. Get a close up, so you always you can have it right at the end. All right, body plan for tapeworms basically broken down into three different parts. Uh, you have your head, which is the attachment organ. You have your neck, which is the germinative region, and then you have the strobula, which is all of the proglottids. All right, so the scolex is right at the anterior end. That is the attachment organ. Oops. Let's move that over. That's the attachment organ. And there's three types of scolices. And we'll, we'll go through those, those three types. Behind the scolex is the neck. This is a germinative region that gives rise to the strobula. Right, so that's where you can say our germ cells are. 
that will ultimately give rise to each proglottid. And once we have a proglottid that forms, once we start seeing separation, distinctions, a separation between each individual one, we have now entered the strobola. Now, the strobola is described as the region of strobilization, and strobilization is the production of proglottids. So our strobola region is basically the region of proglottids. What's a proglottid? It's an independent section with a complete set of male and female reproductive organs. Usually, the male system will mature first, and then the male system will begin to degenerate as the female system starts to mature. Why is that? Why is that? Any guesses? Anyone? Yeah. Male system matures first, then degenerates as the female system starts to mature. So, so why do that? Yeah, so you don't really want to have fertilization, self-fertilization occurring within a single proglottid. All right, you can have cross-fertilization between you know later proglottids and earlier proglottids. They can kind of fold back on themselves, uh, but you really want to avoid uh, reproducing or self-fertilization within the individual proglottids. Uh, and you can kind of think of it as if there was a mutation that happened during that initial generation of proglottid, that proglottid's going to have that mutation. Right, it's going to have that mutation, so we want to try to avoid those. Uh, and I have this note of progression of maturity. If you haven't picked it up, we start our, our proglottid formation, right, and we enter the, the strobola, and then as we go posteriorly, we're getting older and older and older proglottids. So it's not we're not adding on at the end, we're adding on at the beginning, and then the worm lengthens that way until it hits basically maximum size. Because then once we get ma maximum size, these sporadic proglottids will usually detach um, or just degenerate uh, and give rise to the next one that, that's in order. So the age, we get older as we progress posteriorly. All right, scoliosis. There's three types, three main types. First type is acetabular. Acetabular, so named because it possesses suckers. Usually four, usually four, but it doesn't always have to have four. At least in, in genre, families usually, it's consistent. It's four, four suckers, or fewer or more. Right? So usually it possesses four suckers. That is, that is an acetabular scolex. And then it can have extra accessory organs. So it could have a rostellum, which is up here at the top. The rostellum is adversible, so it can go out, it can pull in. It doesn't always have to, some are fixed. Right? But it has muscles, if it's going to avert, it has muscles anyways where it can kind of move it. And oftentimes that rostellum is covered in hooks. Again, it doesn't have to. The slides that we have in the lab, we're going to see the rostella, uh, and they have hooks. They're armed, with what you can say. So you can see the different hooks. You've got hook shape, you've got your base, you got the handle. Base and the handle are attached to muscles that can allow them to kind of dig in and help with attachment. Uh, this acetabular scolex type is typical of members in the order Cyclophilidia. It's typical of the order Cyclophilidia. We'll see the scolex type. Ready? Scolex type 2 is called a Bothria. Bothria. A Bothria Scolex has shallow, elongated, weakly muscular grooves. No suckers. So these things are what, I, what we quote them as uh, sucking grooves. So you can think more of like a kind of a mitten 
where you can have weakly muscular, and when they contract, you can kind of grasp and hold on to parts of the intestine. And there's various types of them, uh, but again, no suckers. They're going to be a shallow groove, and they're going to be muscular so that they can kind of pinch and hold, hold on. This scolex is typical of members in the order Pseudophilidia. So we have cyclophilidia, we have pseudophilidia, and, and for the diversity, we will kind of break it off into these, these two different orders. Ready? Last type is bothridia. It can also be called philidia. These are highly muscular, highly variable shape, but in all of them, the margins are, tend to be thin and flexible. Usually, these leaf-shaped bothridia will occur in groups of four. And this just kind of shows the diversity. Some of these bothridia are just, I mean, that's what they are, almost like leaves with thin edges that, again, they can contract and kind of pinch a little bit to hold on. Or they grasp, and then when they contract, they form suction on it. Again, it's not a sucker, but it kind of could function somewhat like the sucker. You know, some of them have bothridia, where you've got these shallow depressions, you can say loculi. Uh, loculi with muscular septa. We saw that in our acanthobothrium. We saw those as a bothridia type of scolex. Some of them had these structures. These things that they can stick out and pull back in, these arm whips at the end. At the end, so a lot of diversity in these in these guys. Some of them have hooks, um, you know, muscular pods, and so forth. This crow, I, I would have said it's typical of the order Tetraphilidia, uh, but that that group has been split into numerous orders. All right. Any questions on the scolex? This is the main attachment organ. That's what it is. That's its function. Strobula uh, region is where we have all of our proglottids. So the strobula represents a linear series of reproductive organs of both sexes. So if we talk about the male sex or the female sex, we can call it the genitalium. And each proglottid or individual segment, the proglottid itself is the area around the genitalium. The proglottid proglottis, the proglottid has the genitalium, both of them in there. Now, what's kind of cool is that tapeworms, most of the tapeworms that, that we see and we're familiar with, they are polyzoic, which means that our tapeworms have multiple proglottids. They develop and have multiple proglottids. But we do have worms that are monozoic, which means they only have one single proglottid, like this one. You have your Bothria scolex. So this is monozoic. You have your male and female genitalium all within this one structure, and you really don't have any distinction between the neck and the strobil. It's basically all one inside of the body. So monozoic individuals are in the order of Caryophyllidia. That is our, you know, what, acanthobothrium? Uh, no, uh, we didn't have that. Uh, we had another, another tapeworm option in our lab that no one picked. So. That wasn't presented, but we will talk about. Uh, we have an example of the Caryophyllidia. So normally we're going to focus on our polyzoic tapeworms, and constrictions will exist between these proglottids, and that gives the appearance of segmentation. It gives the appearance of segmentation, but they're not like completely walled off from each other. Right, there is connections. They share excretory canal. They share nervous system all the way down. So that's why I said the constrictions exist, but no membranes actually separate those proglottids until they are ready to drop. 
until they are ready to drop and pass out. But not all, not all of our tapeworms will drop for glottids. And if we have no membrane separating them, then you've got your tegument, the muscle, nerves, excretory system, everything else, they're all continuous. It's a big slide with a lot of definitions on it. Ready? All right, so we already said maturation extends posteriorly. All right, that was part of, of our uh, body parts, or our body plane. So that in the immature proglottids, so we're gonna, we can distinguish between mature, immature, and gravid. In the immature proglottids, the genitalium, genitalia are indistinct. So you really can't tell male from female. You can't, really can't tell, oh, this will be male, male side of things, these will be the female side. These are just immature, they're developing. The mature proglottids, they are sexually mature. So you're going to see a fully developed male system for, and or a fully developed female system. Uh, when we try to key these out, when we look at them, we look at the mature segments, and we try to take those segments that, that, have, that still have both male and female. In some cases, we can't see them all clearly, so we look at, at um, some of the earlier ones, that only have the, the male side that has developed. And that kind of get, tells us how many testes we have, you know, where are they, and so forth. Mature proglottids, maybe it can occur within a proglottid or between proglottids in a single worm. And you can have it between different worms. But again, I think the preference is not to have reproduction within a single proglottid. The preference would likely be some sort of cross fertilization. And again, definitely. Try to get cross fertilization between worms, not necessarily within the same worm. Once the mature proglottids reproduce and mate, then you have development of the eggs. All right, and now we will have uh, proglottids that are called gravid. So these are proglottids that contain our fully developed eggs or our shelled embryos. Those eggs, the embryos might not be fully developed at all. But we have the eggs. You, have, you can see the shell. And usually that's all that's going to be in there. So your, your female system has now degenerated and you are producing your uh, eggs. Now one thing that you can see is sometimes in these proglottids, they are very clear edges. Other times, you will have proglottid, and then the one below it kind of has overlap in it. So you can see the margin, both margins. You can see the posterior or the anterior margin of the posterior proglottid and the posterior margin of the anterior. Man, that's a, that's a mouthful. But you get this overlap. All right, That's what the, these two terms are talking about. Craspido posterior margin of proglottid could overlap the anterior margin of the next proglottid. So we've got this overlap. And we do have slides where you can see that. You can see the overlap. If they don't overlap, then we, we call them acraspido, which means the margins do not overlap. So that's our terms. You're going to see those things. So that may be like a lab question. You know, describe the, are these, you know, uh, craspidote or acraspidote? You should look at it to be able to answer it. Ready? Egg release can occur in a couple different ways. It's going to be species specific. So we can have apolysis. That is when the gravid proglottids detach and then pass from the host. Apolysis. Sometimes with that apolysis, these gravid proglottids will rupture while they're on their way out. And apolysis is a case where the, the these proglottids do not detach. All right, so if they're not going to detach, 
then the eggs have to be released. And they're going to be released through a uterine pore. So eggs are released through a uterine pore or potentially through a tear in the tegument. And then once the gravid proglottid has exhausted all of its eggs, all of its eggs are out, at that point then the proglottid will detach and just basically disintegrate. Or disintegrate. Anapholysis is also a pseudoapholysis. Pseudoapholysis. You can uh, use those terms interchangeably. And then hyperapholysis is what we saw with the acanthobothrium. This is where our immature proglottids will detach. So you've got part of that apolysis there. But they're immature proglottids. They will detach, continue development and maturation while they're traveling through the gut. Something's out there buzzing. And this is kind of interesting because it, you can ask the question, why do that? Well, maybe if you're a short tapeworm, what you do is you get your energy and then you just let the proglottid continue developing. It allows you to continue making more and more proglottids and dropping them off. And just letting them develop as, as they progress. We'll see both apolysis and, and, and apolysis. And that will be a part of the life cycle. That will be a part of the life cycle that you have to identify. Ready? All right, tegument. So we are still part of the neodermata. Still has syncytial tegument. We just say, I mean, it's part of the platyhelminthes. But we now have some, some extra stuff that has to develop. All right, so in our diagenetic trematodes, right, they, they're absorbing stuff through the tegument. You've got a functioning tegument. But they also have a mouth, so they can acquire nutrients through just normal feeding. Not so with the tapeworms. Tapeworms lack a mouth, they lack a digestive system. It means all of their nutrients have to be absorbed through the tegument. So we've got our still syncytial tegument, but now the tapeworms have something called microtricks, or microthricks, or that's what I learned, microtricks. I guess it's kind of a good question. Where's is that eye, you know, soft eye, or like it sounds like a Y, who knows? But what are microtricks? These are basically small, like, villi. They're finger-shaped tubules that project out into the lumen of the gut. So they project away from, uh, from the main body uh, of the worm. This outer limiting membrane projects out toward the host as numerous finger-shaped tubes. And that's going to drastically increase the surface area. So instead of being so smooth or have small pits, We've got these microtricks that really increase surface area that allows these guys to acquire their nutrients. Sometimes, and these are the tubes, the microtricks, you can see them, uh, the shape and pattern can aid in identification. So you look at worms and you're like, yeah, these look very similar. They're probably the same species. Then you do SDN like, holy cow, we got completely different microtricks structures. These are almost arranged. Almost like scales, but these are outer tegument. There's your finger like tubules again, increasing surface area to acquire all of the nutrients. And they have every, again, it has everything just like a regular platyhelminthes, cytons, uh, internuncle uh, canals, and all that stuff. Ready? All right. Excretory osmoregulatory system. Proto-nephridia. We're in the platyhelminthes. Now what we do have is lateral collecting ducts, or longitudinal collecting ducts that can connect uh, with a lateral commissure. Right? And these are going to run the entire length of the worm. So normally you have a dorsal and a ventral canal that runs the length of the worm. And we can see it on some of our slides. Uh, normally you look at the immature section to really see these things, but uh, actually you look at the immature section so that you don't see, we're not confused as to what I'm pointing at. Right? I, I don't want to point at testes, follicular testes, if you know, I'm going for this structure. Right? But they're going to be paired, dorsal and ventral. They're going to run on each side of the, uh, of the strobola. And often they have these lateral commissures or transverse duct 
that connect the ventral canals. Uh, and if they're there, they're normally, you see them in the, the posterior section, in the posterior part of the fly. And these canals merge near the scolex. These canals have the clam cell system associated with them. So again, features of the platyhelminthes, there they are. Just a slight modification now, have dorsal and ventral canals. Ready? I guess we'll probably stop here. Uh, we didn't get to the Reproductive system, but to be quick, reproductive systems, again, we're in the platyhelminthes, so we're going to see the same terminology, uh, similar structures, but now all of that middle area that we see on the side, you can still see that follic follicular vitel area. But in some of these orders, the vitel area, the vitellin follicles are now condensed, compressed and condensed into a compact vitel area. All right. And that's what we're going to see. And we have worms in the lab that where you can see this, this compact vital area. Um, so we'll look at those. All right. Joe, I'll get this. Uh, let's go. can't believe I forgot to do it. Where's our video capture? We're not connected. Look at that. No one said anything. Yeah, are we not plugged in? Well, that's a bummer. I wonder if someone unplugged it. They did unplug it. Look at that. Well, I guess we don't have that life cycle up. 